All right, the title of the sermon is Do Ye Now Believe? Do Ye Now Believe? Now, we all know salvation is by grace through faith. But, you know, faith is more than just salvation. Salvation isn't the only thing in the Christian life that is based on faith. This is why we read in Romans 1, we see here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So that's one of our memory verses. And that's salvation there, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, As it is written, look at this, the just shall live by faith. So notice there, in our faith, we go from faith to faith. So you don't want to equate salvation just with faith. Yes, faith is how we get salvation. But there's there's a lot more to faith than just salvation. The Christian life is lived by faith. It says here, the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So just because we're saved, that doesn't mean we have a strong faith in other areas of the Christian life. So there's more to faith, like I said, than just being saved. And we all struggle in this area. Here's an example of a man with a son who was possessed with the devil. And they come to Jesus because the disciples couldn't cast out the possessed from the, from the child. It says here, and they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, this is the child, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, this is Jesus now asking the father of the child who is on the ground wallowing, wallowed, foaming, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So is this a question of whether the man is saved or not? No, it's faith in other areas of the Christian life, how much faith he had in God to heal his son. And straightway, and this is where I find uh, you know, quite, quite um, what's the word, touching, you know? And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So you can see there in the Christian life that we can have a faith on Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean we don't struggle to have a stronger faith in other areas of the Christian life. And this ought to be our prayer as Christians, that yes, we believe on Jesus Christ, but we should often ask Jesus to help us in areas of our unbelief. And that's what we're going to look at today, and I want you to reflect on today, is do you now believe? Because Jesus here in John 16, he wasn't asking the disciples if they are saved when he said, do you now believe, in verse 31. He's asking if they believe he's overcome the world, that he's coming back to rule and to reign, so that they will go through the tribulations that they're going to go through joyful. You know, when they're blessed, that they're persecuted for righteousness' sake, that they would be of good cheer. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? And that's my question I want you to reflect on this morning, is do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you. See, these are the things in the chapter. He talks about trials. Remember, he talked about the woman giving birth in travail. But, you know, when when the baby comes, she's joyful, you know, that a man-child is born. So what he's likening this to is, like, you're going to go through hard times. You're going to go through this tribulation. But when I come back, no man's going to take away that joy. That's what he's referring to. So he's saying to the disciples, Do you believe these things that I'm telling you? These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome 
the world. So you see how a good test of whether or not they believed what Jesus was saying, that Jesus had overcome the world, is would they go through the trials and tribulations with good cheer? We saw that in Acts last week, right? Where they were, you know, they, they were left joyful, that they were counted worthy to suffer name, uh, shame for his sake. So we see there that they did believe in certain instances. And obviously the Christian life is up and down. So what you believe will impact your perspective on things. You know, what you believe will impact how you live your life. So let's consider some truths in the Bible and what I want, to, what I want you to ask yourself this morning and what I want us to ask ourselves this morning. Right? Do ye now believe? Do ye now believe? So do you believe, number one, that the Bible is God's word? You know, the Bible was not always at, our, at people's fingertips. You know, we take it for granted that we carry it in our pocket, can just search for passages in, in a second. But do you know that you know, people died to obtain the Bible? People died to translate the Bible. There was a time where Bibles were scarce and the Word of God was scarce. You know, but we tend to take God's Word for granted because things are just so available to us. But do you realize what you have access to? The Word of God. So do you now believe the Bible is God's Word? 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So it teaches us what's right, doctrine, what's wrong, reproof, for correction, how to make it right, and for instruction in righteousness, how to keep it right. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So, do you believe? Do you believe that you have God's word? Not just, you know, yeah, the Bible's God's word. I mean, do, do you really internalize this? Do you have a strong faith? in believing that the Bible is God's word and you realize what you have, that you have the words of the living God at your fingertips. When was the last time you read those words of the living God? So maybe if you believe the Bible is God's word, maybe you'd read it more. Maybe you'd study it more. Maybe you'd memorize it more. Maybe you'd use it more when you talk and you explain certain things. You would use it because you're, you are, you're using the word of God. It's not just the word of man. It's not just somebody's opinion. It's the word of the living God that you have. If you believe that, maybe you'd treat it as such. Maybe you'd spend more time talking about it. Maybe you'd spend more time making sure your children know it and understand it. Because you why? Because you believed the Bible is the word of God. Look at what Psalm 119, 97 says. It says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. See, so David is saying here he loves God's word so much. That's what he thinks about all the time. Is that, can you say that? This is a challenge to us, right? You know, I don't even think I can say that. So I'm challenging all of us this morning. I want you to think, like Jesus said to his disciples, do you now believe? Do you believe the Bible is God's word? Or is it something you just say but don't believe? This is not about your salvation. Right? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm just saying, do you fully comprehend what do you have in your hand? Let's think about another one. Do you now believe? That God is overall? What do I mean by that? God is, first of all, omniscient. Omniscient means he knows everything. First John 3, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. What about God's omnipresence, the fact that he's everywhere? Psalm 139.7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? So whither, if you don't know the word whither, whither means to where. So he's saying, to where shall I go from thy spirit? 
or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. So there's two aspects, obviously, to God's omnipresence, is that no matter where you go, you cannot flee from his presence. But that's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because on the one hand, God is everywhere, watching all things. But on the other side, it's a comforting truth because no matter where you go, he says here, even, by, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. What about God's omnipotence? The fact that he can do anything. Jesus looking upon them saith, with men is it, it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So, my question to you, I want you to think about this morning, is do you now believe? Do you believe that God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent? Maybe you would reconsider. If you believe God was omnipresent, omniscient, maybe you would think about the things that you do in private when you think nobody is watching. Maybe it might change the way you live, that you don't live one way when you're seen of men and another way when you're not seen of men. Right? Because God is always seeing you. But do you believe? Do you believe that? Maybe you'll reconsider what you fill your heart and mind with because it's not just the outward appearance that matters. God sees your heart as well. So what is in your heart and what do you fill your heart with? See, it's not just important what's outward. What's important is inward too. You know, maybe it'll cause you to live a life more of integrity, knowing that God sees all. If you believe God, or with God all things are possible and that he's omniscient, that he knows all things, maybe that would make you more a person of prayer and fasting. What about people who are fearful or anxious? Well, do you now believe that God is all-powerful? And just like David said in the Psalms, that no matter what happens, God is always with you. Maybe then you would trust God to take, of the thing, take care of the things that you can't. Maybe you wouldn't be so worried about things. And maybe you wouldn't be so anxious. The question is, do you believe? And that goes back to that original prayer of that father. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Um, let's look at Matthew 8 here. Because when we're fearful of things, that generally is linked to a lack of faith. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful? Look at this. O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So he said they were worried about their life in a ship when they were with Jesus. But see, if they believed who Jesus was and they you know, believed, then they would not have to be fearful. See, this is not about their salvation. The question is, did they believe Jesus had the power to protect them when he's with them in that storm? That's the question that I want you to ask this one. Do you believe that God is over all? If you do, maybe you wouldn't be so worried, so anxious, so fearful in your life. Number three. Do you now believe? Do you believe that there's life after death? That there is an afterlife? That there is an eternal life besides this life alone? 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're temporary. For the things which are not seen are eternal. See, if you believe that there was life after this, and that that life afterwards lasts for eternity, 
versus what James says. What is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. But do you believe that? Do you believe that life is short? That life is temporary? That life is not all there is? And that after this life, there is an eternity where you will be existing? And what you've done in this life is going to determine what your eternity is like. Do you now believe? Or maybe if you believed it strongly, you'd make different decisions in your life. Maybe you'd spend your time differently. You know, maybe you would spend your money differently. See, maybe you wouldn't just live life to please yourself and just have a goal to be like the rich fool, to take thine ease, drink, eat, drink, and be merry. See, maybe you will do things that are right, even if it costs you a lot in this world. Why? Because you believe that there is something after worth living for. You know, maybe you'd strive to be more consistent in your service to God because you know it's building up treasure in heaven rather than laying up treasures on earth. 2 Peter 3.10. This is one of my favorite verses, and I, I, I go to this verse. I'm sure those of you have been out, you know, you guys have been out church a long time. I love this passage because it really makes you think about how you're living your life. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. So it's saying, knowing that everything that you see, remember 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, everything that you can see is temporary. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You know what it's saying there? What sort of person? How should you live your life knowing that everything that you can see in this world will one day be gone? How are you going to live your life? Do you now believe? Do you believe this truth? Or maybe if you believed it with, with a strong faith, it would change the way you live. It changed the way you spent your time. It had changed the way you spent your money. Do you now believe? That is the challenge this morning I want you to think of. Number four. Number four is, do you believe that hell is real? That hell is a real place. Luke 16, verse 22. Such a, such a tragic passage in Luke 16, 22. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So I think the most impacting thing in this passage is we get some insight into the mind of somebody who is suffering in hell. And what is the thing, that, what are the two things they think of? It's how can they reprieve themselves of this torment and they're not able to? But you know, the second thing he's thinking in hell is I don't want anyone else to come here. Right? I have five brethren. Go and send Lazarus so that they can tell them of this place so they don't come here as well. So my question to you is, do you believe 
that hell is real. Because if it is, maybe it will give you a stronger desire to go soul winning. You know, maybe it'll make you make sure that you're ready to preach the gospel. You know, I, I, was, I was talking about this not long ago in a sermon, and, you know, you know we, all, <laughs> we all wish for the day that we have that, you know, Acts, you know, uh, was it Acts, um, Acts 16 moment where the Philippian jailer comes out and says, what must I do to be saved? And I had something close to that not too long ago where I was sitting at jiu-jitsu, you know, just watching my kids and um, a lady was talking to her husband and they, they, I think because what, what the situation there was there were Jehovah's Witnesses going to her house and she was asking how to get rid of them. <laughs> so her husband turns to me and says, well, ask Victor, he's a Christian. And then that just led into a conversation of me explaining the gospel to her where probably if I had knocked on her door, she would have said, no, you're not interested. But, you know, but sometimes those opportunities just fall into your lap, you know, and somebody who's just ready, willing to listen asks you about the gospel and ask you about Jesus and they're interested in learning. So the question is, are you going to be ready? You know, maybe if you reflected on hell being real and you believed it, you would want to be ready when that opportunity came because you knew that you could impact that person's eternity if you had the answers ready and you were well versed in the verses and you were practiced up on how to explain it. You know, maybe if you believed Hell is real, and you reflected on that. Maybe you would consider your own Christian testimony. What do I mean by that? How you live as a Christian. So that when you get that opportunity to share the gospel, you're taken more seriously. Because even though you don't need to be living right to preach the gospel, you don't need to be living right to be saved, but you know, the more you walk in God's ways, the more you're walking in the Spirit, you know you will be taken more seriously. Why? Because you're going to be preaching with more boldness. You're going to be knowing what you're talking about. And, you know, you're going to have a bit more credibility when you talk about the things of God, when you yourself have a good testimony that you walk with God. So, make sure, you know, you're ready to preach the gospel. Maybe you would consider your own Christian testimony. Maybe you wouldn't be so lax about not being able to clearly explain to another person what it means to be saved. You know, I'm not saying that it's your fault they go to hell. Everyone is responsible for their own sins. Everyone gets an opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ. But isn't it, isn't it a shame if you, know, you were put in somebody's life to preach the gospel to them, to give them the opportunity to be persuaded, and you weren't ready? I mean, that's just... What a shame. You know, that, that, that God was going to use you in that moment, but you weren't ready. Now, I'm not saying it's your fault that they go to hell, because like I said, they are responsible for their own sins. But the fact that you had an opportunity there, but you weren't ready, like 1 Peter 3.15 says, to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason, the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. But if you believed hell was real, maybe you would be ready. That would, that would change how you are ready to preach the gospel. You know, Penn, you know, Penn and Teller from, you know, those famous magici magicians. Okay, he's a famous atheist, famous atheist, Penn, that said, you know, because people are always trying to give him Bibles, give him the gospel, and he was reflecting just on a, you know, sort of a, a video that he put on YouTube saying, he doesn't believe hell, he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, but he understood that if a person did believe in hell and they did believe Jesus Christ was the only way to get saved from hell, he said, you'd have to be somewhat of a, like a jerk, I think he used the word, to not tell people if you believed that. So that's what I'm asking you today. Like, do you believe that? Do you believe that hell is real? Will you take those things seriously? And the last one I want to talk to you about today. Do you believe that God loves you. You know, sometimes we, we're always hard on ourselves, talking about how, you know, that's why I want to end this on a positive note, that, hey, me included, guys, we don't all live the way we ought. 
We, don't, we all come short of the glory of God, not just with, in regards to salvation, but in regards to our Christian life as well. And sometimes it's good to remember, to ask yourself the question, do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God loves you with an everlasting love as a child of God? Do you believe? Do you just say that? Or do you believe it? Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. So that's saying, that's not saying your, 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 what you talk about. This is talking about that your lifestyle, your conversation, should be one that's not materialistic. Right? Be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Do you believe that God loves you? If you do, then maybe, you know, realizing that even when you fail, his love does not diminish. You know, we always use this for salvation. You may forsake God, but he will never forsake you. So, do you believe this? And it's just, it's something great, crazy to, uh, not crazy, but it's something really to reflect on, the love of God. When you think about, I mean, how many times would you have to be wronged by somebody until you give up on them? Have you ever thought about that? you ever thought about, like, what if somebody kept wronging you? You know, the disciples asked Jesus, if my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Still seven times? And obviously he says, still seven times seven. And that's hard enough as it is already. I mean, most, some people, once they get burned, that's it! You know, never again! Or maybe you forgive them once, but if that, you know, it's what do they say? Burnt once, shame on you. Burnt twice, shame on me. They say that. So what is that? Only two opportunities for somebody to, to make up you know, for you? And just think about the sins that we commit daily, multiple times a day, against God, even though what God does for us, and yet he still loves you the same amount as when you got saved, you know? That's something to reflect on. Would we, you know, do we have that same level of love? Absolutely not. It's something we strive for. How many times would you have to be wronged by someone until you give up on them? But with God, you know, there's always forgiveness. With God, there's always another chance to do right. And if you believe that God loves you, maybe you would be easier on others that wrong you. Ephesians 4.32, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Do you believe? Do you now believe that God loves you? Maybe it will give you a greater desire to serve God. Maybe if you realize God loves you, maybe his church will be more important to you. Maybe it will make you try just that little bit harder to serve him. Maybe when you sing to him, you'll sing just that little bit louder because you believe God loves you. And maybe when you go through tough times, when your spiritual walk gets hard, maybe you'll persevere just that little bit longer because you believe God loves you. Let's end it here. 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So my question to you this morning, as Jesus asked his disciples, do you now believe that the Bible is God's word, that God is overall, that there's life after death, that hell is real, and that God loves you? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminders of these truths. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. And I pray, Lord, that these truths of yours would, would resonate and internalize in us. Lord, may it, may it move us, may it change us, and may we always be reminded of them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.